Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Nebulization in the COVID-19 Era, an Evidence-Based Review. Before we get started, I'd like, to take, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your question into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would, not, I would now like to introduce Dr. Rajiv Dahan. Dr. Dahan is a professor and chair of the Division of Pulmonary Medicine Section of Critical Care Medicine at the University of Tennessee Graduate School of Medicine. He is an internationally recognized researcher in the area of aerosolized medicine, particularly with regard to the delivery of medications and COPD. Dr. Dahan, you have the floor. Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. We, I just want to um, mention that this is uh, the content and is developed and funded by Theravance for this webinar and that I will receive compensation from them. The presentation is entirely informative and educational and the content is continuing to evolve but is current as of 31st August of this year. Regarding my disclosures, I have received personal fees from AstraZeneca, Boringa, Ingelheim, Milan, UpToDate, and Teva, and I'm also a recipient of a research grant from Milan. So we will be discussing the use of nebulizers during the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that patients with viral respiratory infections, including those with COVID-19, benefit from nebulized therapies, especially administration of bronchodilator aerosols for alleviating respiratory distress. However, it is uncertain if the administration of nebulized aerosols increases transmission of viruses and poses a health risk to clinicians. So the four main objectives of this presentation are to discuss how viral respiratory pathogens are transmitted, the impact of coronavirus on nebulization, and review the current recommendations for administering nebulized medication during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in view of the fact that nebulizing, nebulizer therapy may be considered as an aerosol generating procedure. So let's start with uh, getting your opinion on what is your institution's practice for delivering bronchodilators prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. So the first option is that you were using only handheld devices and no nebulizer therapy was utilized, or you were using number two, nebulized therapy only, that is the NEB only protocol, the third option is mix of both handhelds and nebulized therapy, and four is other. May I have the polling? So very good. It uh, looks like uh, you know the mix of both handhelds and nebulized therapy is the majority of people are using that. So can we move on to the next slide, please? So let's talk about briefly how viral respiratory pathogens are transmitted. So we know that most of the transmission occurs from infected individuals during coughing or sneezing or talking or laughing, and that this produces droplets, which are generally larger in diameter and they settle to the ground within short distance of about less than two meters because of gravitational effects. However, some of these droplets are smaller in size and they can evaporate to form droplet nuclei, which, are, which remain suspended in the air like dust particles in the air. And so they can be suspended and they can travel to a further distance to infect a susceptible individual. So the main modes of transmission then for 
uh, COVID-19 appears to be airborne, so you could have direct transfer by droplet transfer when a person coughs or sneezes in the vicinity of a susceptible individual, or it could also occur through contact either directly by shaking hands or hugging, or indirectly because someone touches an object or a fomite and then a susceptible individual touches the same object. So the transmission of the virus through airborne routes is complex. It depends on many variables besides the, the droplet size, the environmental conditions, especially the humidity, temperature, the ventilation in the room, airflow in the room because of movement of people, and whether you know, it's indoors or outdoors. The other thing, of course, is crowding, and that is seen usually in, uh, in cruise ships or prisons or spread occurring in call centers or meat packing plants and so on. Then, of course, there are host factors, which include uh, comorbidities and receptor distribution. Vocal projection through breathing or talking or singing or shouting, coughing, sneezing, all of these are modes by which viruses may be transmitted. And there is, for example, a super spreader event that occurred in Washington state during choir practice while people were singing. So there is a high risk of transmission via inhalation by droplets or aerosols, especially if the particles, the virus particles come into contact with the eyes or mucous membranes, and they have the most potential to cause nosocomial transmission through aerosol generating procedures. So what are aerosol generating procedures? These are some medical procedures which generate aerosols that could potentially release the virus into the air and spread infection to a susceptible individual. So the CDC defines an aerosol generating procedure as any medical procedure performed on a patient that can induce production of aerosols and droplet nuclei. So such procedures are more likely to generate high concentrations of infectious respiratory aerosols than coughing, sneezing, talking, or breathing, and presents the risk of opportunistic airborne transmission of pathogens not naturally spread by the airborne route. So the potential to place healthcare personnel at increased risk of pathogen exposure and infection, especially if infection control measures and PPE are inadequate. But there is neither expert consensus nor sufficient supporting data to create a definitive comprehensive list of aerosol generating procedures for healthcare settings. So let's look at what the CDC and the WHO think of aerosol generating procedures. Mainly these could be invasive procedures such as intubation, bronchoscopy, or manual ventilation, or they could be non-invasive such as uh, administration of nebulized treatment, oxygen therapy, or non-invasive ventilation. But Interestingly, the CDC and the WHO, as of June 2020, both organizations now state that it is uncertain whether aerosols generated by nebulizers are infectious, as can be seen here, that they do not think that these are definitively established to be uh, aerosol generators, and they do not advise against uh, the use of nebulized treatments. So the CDC and the WHO also have a good agreement on what constitutes infection control measures and also on the PPE required 
worthwhile to mitigate the spread of the virus, and these include the use of N95 or higher level respirators, eye protection, the use of gown and gloves, and use of negative pressure rooms while administration of nebulizers or other aerosol generating procedures are being carried out. The opinion of various professional societies and organizations in the United States and in the NIH is shown on this slide. Most organizations agree on the various aerosol generating procedures. So the administration of nebulized treatment is considered as aerosol generating procedure, except that the IDSA does not consider that as an aerosol generating procedure. So the various agencies agree with the CDC and the WHO on the infection control measures and PPE for aerosol generating procedures. So the prominent pulmonary and critical care medicine organizations such as ATS, CHEST, and AARC advise against nebulizer treatments when feasible. So it is important for us to follow the CDC preventive guidelines and also those from local health departments and one's own institutions. But clearly, during aerosol generating procedures, CDC recommends that healthcare personnel in the room should wear N95 or higher level respir respirators such as disposable filtering face piece respirator, PAPR, or elastomeric respirators, and they should also have eye protection, gloves, and gown. The number of HCPs present during the procedure should be limited to only those essential for patient care and procedure support. Visitors should not be present, and AGPs should ideally take place in negative pressure rooms and the room surfaces should be cleaned and disinfected promptly as described in the section on environmental infection control. So what is the evidence that coronavirus transmission can occur by or during nebulization? This slide looks at various viruses that have caused recent epidemics and pandemics of respiratory infections. We had the SARS-CoV-1 virus in 2002, the H1 ep epidemic in 2009, then the MERS coronavirus in 2012, and of course, the SARS coronavirus 2 in 2019. And the routes of transmission are still not fully agreed upon, but clearly droplet or aerosol transmission is important for all of these uh, viruses. The aerosol transmission of H1N1 has not been definitively established. So these viruses have the ability to infect susceptible individuals to a variable degree, and the R0 estimates for SARS-CoV-2 are about the same as those of SARS-CoV-1. The incubation periods vary from 2 to 15 days uh, or 1 to 13 days for SARS-CoV-1 and 2 to 14 days for SARS-CoV-2. So the symptoms could be variable from minimal symptoms to severe symptoms. We know that SARS-CoV-2 transmission occurs from relatively asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic individuals, and about 20% of individuals have severe illness. So the case fatality rates are not clearly worked out. They are quite variable. Uh, this this numbers continue to change, but it does appear that the case fatality rate for SARS-CoV-2 
is somewhat lower than was estimated for SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV virus. So the long-term sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 have not been elucidated so far. And also, as of October 5th, the CDC has said that transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus could occur beyond six feet in closed environments uh, where, where there is poor ventilation. And also, cumulative exposure over 24 hours might be responsible for transmission. So going back to the aerosol transmission of SARS-CoV-1, uh, during this uh, epidemic, Hong Kong was the hardest hit, and it, there was an outbreak in an apartment complex in Hong Kong, which airflow modeling studies proposed that occurred due to a toilet leaking into a ventilation shaft, and then uh, the air was carried to distant sites by air currents generated through exhaust fans. Likewise, there were episodes of nosocomial transmission, especially very early in the epidemic when the, the transmissibility of the virus was not recognized. But overall, healthcare workers accounted for about 20% of all cases globally. And in the index patient in Hong Kong who received nebulizer treatments, it is very likely that there was a lack of infection control measures and PPEs when nebulizers were being used because the infection was not recognized at that time. And that did lead to infection in a number of people. And for that reason, uh, the use of nebulizers was stopped in, during that epidemic. But a separate case report from Taiwan did not find evidence of SARS DNA products in air samples near an infected patient receiving treatment via a large volume nebulizer, and they concluded that that it was unlikely that this nebulization was spreading the virus. The data on the transmission of MERS virus is somewhat more limited, and so we would not be discussing that. So in 2012, TRAN uh, did a systematic review of nosocomial transmission to healthcare workers caring for patients undergoing aerosol generating procedures. And although the underlying evidence was not of high quality, they concluded that nebulizer use did not increase the risk of uh, transmission of you know, the virus to healthcare workers. The procedures which were reported to present an increased risk of transmission included procedures like tracheal intubation, tracheotomy, non-invasive ventilation, and bag mass ventilation. But they also thought that prolonged exposure and poor infection control measures or compliance may also contribute to nosocomial transmission. So aerosolization as a potential transmission pathway for SARS-CoV-2 is shown on this slide. Three studies are shown here. One by, is an experimental study by Van Duramelen, and the other one is uh, from a clinical study from uh, Nebraska by Santarpia and colleagues, and the most recent one is a study by Lednicki and colleagues. So the study by Van Doremelen looks at experimental conditions of SARS-CoV-2 and 1, and what they did in this study was that they generated aerosols with a three-jet collision nebulizer and maintained them in a Goldberg drum uh, 
uh, at a set temperature and relative humidity, and then they sampled the virus at different time points, and they found that the SARS-CoV-2 remained viable in aerosols for the duration of the study, which was three hours, and the half-lives for SARS-CoV-1 and 2 were very similar with a median of about one hour. So the study from Nebraska looked at air and surface samples collected in 11 isolation rooms where 13 mo mostly mildly symptomatic patients were being monitored. So in this study, the healthcare workers used appropriate PPE and airborne precautions. And what they found was that about 65% of air samples in the rooms and about 60% in the hallways tested positive for viral RNA at low concentrations. And it was their belief that the air in the hallways was positive because the virus was being carried into the hallways by the movement of healthcare workers from those rooms. So the viral replication was detected at two samples in cell culture. So, so most of the samples, they could not detect viable virus. So the highest air concentrations in the patient rooms occurred during nasal cannula therapy in the absence of cough. The third study was by Lednicki, and they sampled air in one isolation room where there were two patients in that room, one of whom was symptomatic. And what they did, they used a liquid culture, liquid collection system, which preserved the virus better than filters, which are dry. So the room was in a designated COVID-19 ward with efficient filtration and UV radiation, but it was not an airborne infection isolation room. That is, it was not a negative pressure room. And about 67% of the samples tested positive for viral RNA at distances of more than two meters. But the, the concentrations were low and there were no aerosol generating procedures being used on these patients. So all the positive samples then, they also tested on cell cultures and found cytopathic effects consistent with viable virus. So this next slide looks at the first case of community acquired COVID-19 in the United States, which was, the case was confirmed on 26th February, 2020. And some of you may remember this patient. Uh, so this was in a community hospital in Solana County, California. And this patient uh, exposed more than, a, almost 121 healthcare workers were exposed to this patient. And of course, at that time, the infection was not recognized, so the infection control measures and PPE use was inadequate. So 43 of the 121 patients who were exposed went on to develop symptoms, and they were able to test and find that only three of them tested positive for coronavirus. So they were able to interview 37 of those 43 patients, and they found that all three of the patients who tested positive actually had performed physical examinations on these patients. So they had more close and prolonged exposure. And then two out of the three patients, uh, two out of the three individuals had also been in the room when nebulizer treatments were being given. So on this basis, they thought that nebulized treatments may be one of the factors that increase the transmission of the virus. So the risk of transmitting COVID-19 during nebulizer treatment was examined to, by the VA in an evidence synthesis program. So they've 
this was commissioned by the VA uh, as well as the WHO to answer this question about whether uh, nebulizer use is a risk factor for transmission of the virus. So in Wuhan, which was the epicenter of the pandemic, nebulizers were used frequently in hospitalized patients with SARS-CoV-2. But the relationship of these treatments to infection of hospital workers was not analyzed. And no studies have compared the transmission risk between MDIs and nebulizers. So they concluded on the basis of their literature review that evidence that exposure to nebulizer treatment increases transmission of coronaviruses similar to COVID-19 is inconclusive, and there was minimal evidence about SARS-CoV-2 specifically. Yet, the possibility that nebulizers increase viral transmission cannot be ruled out. So, this is data from Wuhan, where they looked at 116 doctors and 304 nurses who had been commissioned to work in the hospitals during the pandemic. Now, these healthcare workers were obviously performing a variety of procedures during uh, their stay, but they the important thing to note here is that they all wore full PPE during aerosol-generating procedures, including medication suits and isolation gowns. So obviously, most of the physicians were not performing aerosol inhalations. In this study, the aerosol was being given by nebulizer and face mask. And most of these were obviously done by the nurses, and we can see that there were substantial number of treatments were administered by these uh, healthcare workers. So it is important to note, though, that none of the healthcare workers developed any COVID-19 symptoms during the deployment period. And they, after they had completed their deployment period, they were tested for IgG and IgM antibodies, and nasal swabs were taken for PCR, and none of them were positive. So on this basis, they felt that nebulizer therapy was not, uh, did not increase the risk of transmission, provided proper and adequate PPE was worn by the individuals taking care of these patients. So I'm a member of the International Society for Aerosols and Medicine, and we have a regulatory and standardization issues networking group, and they issued an urgent appeal that the development of inhaled therapies for COVID-19 should be accelerated. So they felt that the risk of infection due to administration of aerosols can be mitigated and is lower than the infections due to asymptomatic virus carrying people entering the hospital and breathing, talking without using face masks. So they said that we understand that appropriate personal protective equipment should be worn during inhaled aerosol administration to mitigate the risk of healthcare givers becoming infected. And they requested decision makers and policy makers not to have a blanket statement against aerosol use. So they emphasized that there are currently about 10 nebulized COVID-19 therapies in development in the USA and UK. And there is a study ongoing that is looking at the use of nebulized remdesivir in patients with COVID-19, and another study which has stu studied about 50 hospitalized COVID-19 patients with nebulized interferon beta with some good results. So let's go on to the next audience 
response question and what are your institution's current practices for delivering bronchodilators during the COVID-19 pandemic? Is it handhelds only or handhelds in COVID-19 patients only to preserve uh, the inhalers and using nebulizers for non-COVID-19 patients? Or do you use handhelds in COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 patients, whereas you use nebulizers in some non-COVID-19 patients and ventilated patients? Number four, nebulized products regardless of COVID-19 status, or five is other. So from the responses, it looks like it's split. So there is a distribution between handhelds in COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 patients, and nebulizers in some non-COVID-19 patients and ventilated patients, but a significant number of people do use uh, handhelds in COVID-19 patients only, and nebulizers for non-COVID-19 patients, and some of you use handhelds only, and no nebulizer therapy is utilized. So, uh, and then a significant minority stated that they use nebulized products regardless of COVID-19 status. So, can we move on to the next slide, please? So what are the considerations for nebulized therapies in the COVID-19 era? So this is just to clarify some terminology. We use the term bioaerosol for aerosols that are generated by patients during coughing, breathing, talking, or laughing, or singing. And medical aerosols would be aerosols that are generated by aerosol drug delivery devices, and generally they are not contaminated unless the solutions get contaminated or the personnel who are handling these devices contaminate these devices. So generally the aerosol that is produced by drug delivery devices does not carry viruses or bacteria. But then there are also fugitive emissions, which are the medical aerosols released from the aerosol device during patient expiration. And also for jet nebulizers, the flow of the nebulizer carrying the aerosols from the patient and dispersing them into the environment. So next audience response question, have you ever recommended a filter for use in your practice? So the first option is yes with spirometry or PFT. Number two, yes for use in COVID-19 positive patients or patients under investigation for COVID-19. Number three is unsure. Number four is no. And number five is one and two. So, so the majority of the respondents felt that number one and two were correct. Uh, about a quarter opted for spirometry with PFT only, and small percentages for uh, patients with COVID-19, and few of them were unsure, and uh, about 7% said no. Next slide, please. So this is a study from by McGrath and colleagues, and it is looking at the dispersion of exhaled aerosols released into the environment during nebulization. So they studied two kinds of nebulizers, jet nebulizers and the vibrating mesh nebulizers, and they studied them with a face mask or with mouthpiece, and the mouthpiece could be either filtered or unfiltered. So the highest aerosol dispersion occurred when they were using jet nebulizers with face masks. And then when they used mouthpiece with the jet nebulizer, the aerosol dispersion was less, and this is dispersion to about uh, 
two feet away from the patient. You can see that the dispersion with the vibrating mesh nebulizer is less than that with the jet nebulizer. So the conclusion of this study is that you can reduce aerosol dispersion by using a vibrating mesh nebulizer compared to a jet nebulizer because there is less flow with the vibrating mesh nebulizer. You, you can further reduce the aerosol dispersion by using a mouthpiece instead of a face mask, and you can reduce this even further by using a filtered mouthpiece uh, with either device. So PARI has a filter valve set, and the effect of the filter is comparable to an N95 particulate respirator mask, which retains greater than 95% of all test particles. And the aerosol losses are below 1% of the total aerosolized drug amount in the simulated testing. So the PARI's LC Sprint Nebulizer with a PARI filter valve set is being utilized in ongoing COVID-19 clinical trials. The next slide shows the variety of aerosol delivery devices that we use. Uh, there can be jet nebulizers or vibrating mesh nebulizers. And of course, you're all familiar with meter dose inhalers, dry powder inhalers, and soft mist inhalers. So the jet nebulizers take a longer time to deliver the dose, uh, up to 20 minutes, whereas the mesh nebulizers are faster and can deliver the dose in one to five minutes. The handheld inhalers have the advantage that the dosing can be completed relatively very rapidly. Now, comparing jet and mesh nebulizers, one finds that the aerosol output variability is high with jet nebulizers and low with mesh nebulizers. The efficiency of drug delivery is higher with mesh nebulizers, and the cost is higher as well. So one option for using jet nebulizers is to either use breath-enhanced or breath-activated nebulizers, which would reduce the aerosol generation during exhalation. But the disadvantage of jet nebulizers could be that oral secretions could contaminate the medication reservoir. Although it is, it may not be prudent to know whether this would result in recirculation and re-aerosolization of these secretions. The mesh nebulizers also have the advantage that when they are used in ventilator circuits, they can be they can remain in line for up to 28 days, and medication can be added to the reservoir without breaking the ventilator circuit. And in this case, the oral secretions are separated from the medication reservoir, so the chance of contamination is much less, and the chance of contamination with the handheld nebulizers is much less. So the disadvantage of meter dose inhalers is that they have a low efficiency for aerosol deposition in the lung. The dry powder inhalers require a patient-generated moderate high inspiratory flow rate for proper delivery of the aerosol. and the advantage with soft mist inhalers is that they have a higher efficiency of drug delivery to the lungs. So the International Society for Aerosols in Medicine gave a guidance about how to use medical aerosols in patients with COVID-19. And it was mentioned that although PMDIs have been suggested to present less risk than other medical aerosols. This has never been directly demonstrated. And we also mentioned that the characteristics of the drug formulation can precipitate cough with both nebulizers and inhalers. So the mechanism of bioaerosol generation during cough uh, 
associated with inhalers or medical aerosols from nebulizers is similar to cough that is independent of inhaled medication and likely generates as much bioaerosol. So consequently, inhalers offer no innate advantage in reducing production or dispersion of patient-generated bioaerosols. Even with the use of valved holding chambers, the exhalation from the patient exhausts directly to the atmosphere unless there is a mechanism to filter the exhaled breath. So this is not to say that inhalers should not be used, but that the ability of inhalers to reduce bioaerosol transmission has not been established. And there are a couple of studies from uh, Edwards and colleagues that actually show that in healthy volunteers, you can reduce the generation of exhaled bioaerosols by nebulizing isotonic saline or by giving sodium and calcium salts by nasal installation, and that reduces aerosol production for several hours. So this is data from package inserts for albuterol containing formulations, and one can see that the incidence of cough varies from as low as negligible to almost 5% or higher with various formulations. So that's just to emphasize that cough can occur with any form of uh, aerosol administration. So the the uh, American Hospital Association projects that hospitals will suffer significant economic losses up to $20 billion per month in addition to the losses that have already occurred because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So they estimate the, the Johns Hopkins University data estimate the PPEUs for COVID-19 patients in ICU as well as non-ICU patients. So this, as you can see, there is a significant use increase in use of PPE because uh, to prevent the transmission of infection. And this is, of course, higher in ICU patients than in non-ICU patients, but this is still a substantial cost. And this PPE use, as well as the uh, you know, exposure of healthcare workers to infected patients, could be reduced by reducing the frequency of drug administration. And that is shown on this slide, that the current dosing would be about 4.8 nebulizations per day for patients with COPD exacerbations. And these were data presented at the Society of Hospital Medicine. And this could be reduced significantly if we gave nebulizer treatments with long-acting bronchodilators only once per day. So that would reduce the exposure of patients, uh, of healthcare workers to infected patients and also reduce costs. So let's go to the next audience response question. How are COVID-19 or rule out COVID-19 patients currently being nebulized in your institution? with a standard jet nebulizer plus minus a filter, a breath actuated nebulizer plus minus a filter, a vibrating mesh nebulizer. It is variable depending upon the patient location or unsure or that you're not using nebulizers in COVID-19 patients. So it looks like the majority, uh, almost half of the respondents don't use nebulizers for COVID-19 patients, and a quarter of patients uh, of respondents said that they depend on the patient location. All right, so there may be indications where nebulizers may be helpful for these patients, especially if they have poor lung function by low peak inspiratory flow rates or uh, maximum inspiratory pressures, uh, 
or they may be cognitively impaired. They might have dexterity challenges due to arthritis, Parkinson's disease, or tremors, and poor hand grip strength, or they could have inability to properly use handhelds, for example, to hold their breath or complete all steps associated with handheld use. So some of the practical strategies for delivery of aerosolized medications, we just tried to summarize the, some of the data from the previous slides. So we try to minimize aerosol drug delivery frequency to patients with COVID-19, utilize filters with nebulizers, consider using a of using a mouthpiece instead of a face mask and apply surgical masks on patients during a drug administration via high flow nasal cannula. Use inline mesh nebulizers with an exhalation filter in patients receiving ventilator support and administer aerosol therapy in negative pressure rooms via personal protective equipment and maintain a distance of about at least three feet from the patient during aerosol administration. It is important to wash hands and use proper aseptic technique and to clean, disinfect, or replace jet nebulizers between treatments. For mesh nebulizers, they should be cleaned according to the manufacturer label. And we must abide by the most up-to-date guidance and policies from our institutions state and local health departments, or CDC. But recognizing that there are still significant knowledge gaps, we have minimal evidence that SARS-CoV-2 -CoV, uh, COVID transmission is increased by nebulizer treatments, yet the possibility that nebulizers increase viral transmission cannot be ruled out. But obviously, we need more clinical studies. We need more information on viral transmission risk with nebulization. We need comparisons between handhelds and nebulizers, between different types of nebulizers, differences between various aerosol generating procedures, and the use of PPE and airborne precautions. So another audience Polling question, so what are your views on using nebulized medications during the COVID-19 pandemic? Avoid in all patients regardless of COVID-19 status. Number two, only use in non-COVID-19 patients. Number three, continue to use in appropriate patients with recommended precautions and PPE, for example, negative pressure rooms, and N95 respirators. So it looks like the overwhelming majority, more than 80% of the respondents think that it would be appropriate to use nebulizers in appropriate patients with recommended precautions and PPE. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you so much for your attention and uh, I hope that this was helpful for you. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Dr. Don. Um, this is Carmen Johnson, Senior Medical Director at TheraVance Biopharma. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we do not have any questions coming in from the audience right now. Um, are there any follow-up questions? If so, if you would just um, put it in the Q&A from audience. Okay, we just had one pop in. Um, the question, Dr. Dahan, is do you support development of aerosol medicines for outpatients with COVID? Yes, I, and you know, that is uh, an excellent question, but we need, as I said, we need more studies to look at this uh, issue, but again, the, you know, most outpatients would be using handheld medications, yet there would be certain circumstances where nebulizer use would be needed. And in those circumstances, again, the people around the person taking the aerosol uh, should have 
uh, you know, take precautions not to inhale the fugitive emissions. Thank you. Okay, we just had another question pop in. Do you know any studies on antibiotic uh, nebulizers for um, CF, cystic fibrosis? Um, did you mean in patients with COVID-19? Um, it doesn't specifically say. I think they're, they're just asking about nebulizing antibiotics. Um, yeah, I mean, the CF patients use an, an antibiotics by nebulization for a variety of antibiotics, and I think there are many, many studies on that. Okay, now we have separate questions coming in, Dr. Dahan. Um, the next one is, how long should a room be closed after a nebulized treatment in an outpatient pediatric office? Again, a great question, and I don't think that we have a definitive answer. The one study that I can, uh, that I can tell you about is a study we have recently concluded looking at aerosol particle concentrations after pulmonary function testing. And we find that it takes about 30 minutes for the aerosol particle concentrations to come back to baseline levels. So at this point, I would say that the room should be closed for about 30 minutes, unless you can do some disinfection with ultraviolet light or you know, other disinfectant materials. Thank you for that. The next question comes in and asks, with the risk of COVID and potential lack of screening, what are the current thoughts on initiating trials for nebulizing therapies in patients without COVID, but who need to use the first dose in the clinic? So I think that because of the risk of transmission from relatively asymptomatic or presymptomatic people, we should consider anybody as being infectious at this point. And so anyone who's getting a nebulized therapy, we need to take adequate precautions. Okay, and a follow-up question around um, pediatrics is, do you recommend nebulization in teeth? In children? Yes. Yeah, certainly, you know, that many, many children below the age of three years cannot use uh, handheld devices, so most uh, aerosol therapy has to be done with nebulization. We also have a follow-up question asking you to um, repeat the information about the impact of the normal saline diluent, so Dr. Edwards' study on the aerosol transmission. Maybe we want to go back to that slide. Yeah. So. That study looked at healthy volunteers, and they were given isotonic saline by nebulization, and they found that the aerosol particles were significantly reduced by the administration of the uh, saline. And the other thing was, uh, they have recently done a study with a mixture of sodium and calcium salts by nasal installation and shown that the exhaled particle counts were decreased for uh, six hours and up to 12 hours post-treatment. But um, they are, in fact, looking at uh, marketing this um, for use in, in patients. Okay. Um, some, uh, another question that came in is, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read through some of these and, and prioritize them. Do you think a mesh nebulizer is better um, in the option, uh, an, as an option, I'm sorry, in the current pandemic? So it depends on, uh, you know, the level of respiratory distress that you're treating. Uh, because uh, some patients may not be able to use 
uh, handheld inhalers in, if they are in severe distress. And then the only way that you could prevent intubation in those patients would be to give them bronchodilator therapy with nebulizers. So if the patient needs the therapy, then the whole point on, of this presentation is that the therapy should not be withheld just on the basis that it might cause increased transmission because of infection because we have no evidence that that really happens. And if we take appropriate precautions, then that spread should be minimal. Okay, and we have time for maybe a couple more, Dr. Dehan. Um, what types of aerosol studies would you recommend to increase confidence in providing safe aerosol treatment in patients with infectious respiratory diseases? So that's a great question. Uh, you know, we obviously need more studies to look at what happens during nebulizer use and uh, whether use uh, filtered mouthpieces or not, and then compare that to other handheld devices and see if the viral transmission could be reduced to negligible levels by taking these precautions. And of course, uh, we need studies in the hospital, in the ICU, in the outpatient, adults and children. So there's a huge potential for carrying out for the research in this area. Okay, and then one more question. Is there any data to show increased viral part particulate in the air during the nebulization? Yes, there are data that show that there is increased aerosol particles, and we didn't show those studies, but uh, there is no data to show that there are viruses in those particles. So, you know, there, there are data to show that there is increased particle generation, but uh, the study that I quoted with the large volume nebulizer looked at that and did not find evidence of viral RNA in those particles. Okay, and then, I'm sorry, I have, we have one more question. <laughs> that came in. Um, what role should um, SARS-CoV-2 testing play with regards to risk stratification of patients and inhaled drug delivery? Can you repeat that? That's a long question. Yeah. Um, oh. So what role would um, COVID-19 testing play um, in regard to stratifying patients based on risk and the use of inhaled drug therapy? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you know somebody is uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive, and especially if they have a high concentration of virus in you know being exhaled, uh, and that usually occurs early on in the phase of the infection. So in those circumstances, one has to obviously be more careful and to take all the precautions that we have mentioned aerosolization. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Dehan, and I will turn it back over to Thea. Thank you, everyone, for your attention and your questions. Excellent questions. Thank you, everyone. That's the end of our presentation today. Hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you.